first, before I um, introduce our next speaker, I, I just want to thank those of you who were brave and courageous in coming up here and sharing your inspirations, feedback for the future. It was powerful, and thank you. So round of applause, thanks. <laughs> so I um, have the privilege to uh, get to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jerry Yeager. Jerry Yeager is a clinical psychologist who works with children and adolescents. He is a fellow with the Child Trauma Academy and conducts professional trainings not only here in Colorado, but nationally and internationally. He's also a clinical consultant for Devro Cleo Wallace Behavioral Health Services, Lutheran Family Health Services, Denver Children Advocacy Center, and the Tennyson Treatment Center for Children and Families. Previously, he was the Director of Training and Community Education at the Denver Children's Advocacy Center and the Executive Director of the Children Denver's Home. Jaeger is a member of the Colorado Court Improvement Project and Colorado Systems of Care Steering Committee, and he coordinates a clinical uh, consultation team for the Colorado Department of Behavioral Health. In 2016, Dr. Yeager was recognized as the Child Advocate Victims' Right Partner of the Year by the National Crime Victor, Victim Law Institute. And I had a chance to connect with a few of Dr. Yeager's peers, and each of them consistently said, when they thought of Dr. Yeager, they thought of his passion. It's contagious for the work. And they also uh, appreciated his ability to laugh at himself. And in talking with Jerry, he shared that his humor has gotten him in trouble, <laughs> but he now uses that as a tool in working with communities and families. So with that, let's introduce Dr. Yeager. So we're in day, what, three? Is if we're lucky, most of the things have been repetition. Most of what we're hearing is not anything new. Well, I gotta go back, but it's not anything new, right? As a matter of fact, it isn't about creating something new, it's about remembering something old. Right? We've got to go back and remember that this brain of ours, which really hasn't changed genetically in 200,000 years, was designed to live in an environment that was fairly harsh, that food was scarce, is that it was designed in a way to connect with other human beings. Is that we were one of the weakest, slowest creatures on the planet. And the only way that we could survive is by creating social relationships. And we lived in heterogeneous clans of about 40 to 50 people. We also have been developed is what we're known as, as we're cooperative breeders. Is that there's not many creatures on the planet that as soon as a child is born, we let somebody else pick it up and hold it. For us, when a child is born, we look down at it and say, you know, he has Uncle Harry's eyes. He has Aunt Jane's nose. Is that that child is claimed by the clan. But things have changed in our world. Is that this brain of ours that's uniquely human we don't have to live in the world as it is. 
we can actually create inventions that change the world. We can create inventions that this city that we're looking at here is an invention. The clothes I'm wearing is an invention. The concept of mental health is an invention. Racism is an invention. There is nothing that really goes on in the real world other than what we create in our brains that we then take as reality. So, in a way, when I grew up in New York City, I lived in a building that probably had as many people in it than most little towns. But when I walked out of my doors, every adult in that building felt empowered to discipline me. When I went to school, the teacher actually lived in my building. They were part of my clan. So if something was going wrong, <clears throat> it wasn't somebody was doing something to me. It was, let's talk about what's going on and have that person involved in solving this problem. But not everything that we create with this incredible brain is good for us. Is that our brains are still developed within the bounds of a social relationships. Is that when somebody is able to see me when somebody is able to know me, when somebody is able in some ways to mind my mind, to know me, not what I'm doing, not what I'm saying, but really know me, that condition creates a biochemistry that optimizes my brain to move to the highest levels it's capable of. So that my Biology is intimately connected to the people I interact with. My biology depends on people showing up for me. Is that my brain that I'm standing up here talking about didn't get where it's at because I was just born with these capabilities. I had people show up in my life. Some people, in some ways, allowed this to go on. But when we look about what we're creating today, think about the fact that more and more people are isolated. More and more people live in households alone. Our senior citizens, more than any other time on the planet, live in isolation of other people. For the first time, we're under three people that make up a family. So if my brain depends on social interactions, can a family really do this alone? When we say, oh, we're going to kind of connect with families, really our invention of families today do not allow a family to do this alone. Is that this concept of community has to take place is that children not only are growing up with less and less people in their family, but the average child is spending more and more time interacting with technology. Six to 10 hours a day, not interacting, what's going to create the biochemistry to allow their brains 
to be able to connect with other people. Yes, we could solve problems, and yes, we have information, but we're going to have a harder time connecting with other people if we don't make some different decisions. You see, why we've created these new families structures, why we're giving our kids tools that give information but not create social connections, our schools made decisions to not really care about social connections, to push for academic performance. But you can't academically perform if you can't use that part of your brain. So that these are decisions that elderly people in our culture throughout history had to make decisions about. What do we want to pass on to the next generation? That's what elders do in communities. They make decisions about what the next generation is going to deal with. So that we know that development requires connectedness with other people. We know that. And we also know that whether we like it or not, we're going to be exposed to adversity. The ACES studies told us how adversity in some ways directs our developmental trajectories. But what the ACES studies didn't tell us is that those people who were relationally connected were far less likely to be impacted by adversity. That the biggest adversity we can face as a species is relational poverty. It's feeling isolated and not connected. And so when we're making decisions about where we need to intervene, is how do we not just address financial poverty, but relational poverty? Is that it's within relationships that our biochemistry, our endocrine system, our cardiovascular system, our respiratory system, our immune systems function optimally is that we cannot actually maintain our internal homeostasis outside connectedness with other human beings. So that when we begin to increase fear and anxiety through media, when we create fear and anxiety about if I lose something, I, we're actually hurting our own neurobiology. And when we hurt our neurobiology, we begin to create symptoms. And then we create programs to treat those symptoms. We have bullying programs and substance abuse programs. All of these is are indicators of dysregulated nervous systems that we find alternative solutions to trying feeling whole and healthy. And what we heard up here in all different forms and fashions is that when we create policies that are not disrespected of our biology, but are respectful of our biology, we get better results. When we as elders make decisions and look at our culture and figure out how do we create policies and practice to pass on the things we want to, we will begin to decrease some of this symptomatics in the culture that we live in. And in order to do that, we have to be functioning at the top of our brain. We have to be in a place that we're open to listening. It's very hard yesterday to listen to the stories that those people told us. And what happens is when we are open and we're regulated, we can hear them, we can empathize with them, we can provide support for them. But when their stories overwhelm us, 
we begin to find who can we blame? Who's at fault for that? Or how can I fix them? They don't need fixing. They need to be seen. They need to be heard. They need to be reconnected. That's what they need the most. But we then have to tolerate their experience. And lots of times what happens in our communities is we have a hard time, we have a hard time holding the experience of other people. So that if we really want to make changes, it's not to change the people who are hurting, it's to change us. That's the important thing, right? This guy knew something. He was a smart guy. He warned us. We need to take his warning. The other thing I want to tell you is that our brains develop in a sequential manner. We don't come into the world knowing how to do math. We don't come into the world knowing how to solve complex problems. We do come into the world with the capacity to signal other people that we're in pain, or we're scared, or we're cold. We come into the world with the capacity to connect. Is that our brains are exquisitely designed to change early in life based on the experiences that we have. That we can adapt to any place on the planet. That our ability to adapt is what allows us, and we're most adaptable early in life. Is that this ability is that in the context of relationships, is that the, the way that we are cared for calibrates important neurochemicals in our body that are going to be important in developing our capacity for motivation, our capacity to be able to think, to organize a plan and carry out a plan. Those happen within the relationship early in life. They don't happen when we get to high school. They don't happen when we get to be 21 and 22 years old. Our biology is calibrated in the first three years of life. And then we build on that foundation. Is that when we look now from a neurobiological way and they hear about how depression changes our hippocampus and impacts our memory. But do you know when you look at psychosis, psychosis changes our hippocampus. When you know, when you look at post-traumatic stress, it changes our hippocampus. Really many of these created innovative labels we put on people all indicate that it changes our biology and structure. But really what happened was maltreatment and exposure to adversity early in life is what changes our structure of our brain and the functioning of our brain, which makes us either more resilient or less resilient. So when we start putting, telling people you're more resilient and you're less resilient, I'm blaming you because in some ways you weren't provided the experiences you needed early in life. So when we begin to create programs, our biology said, how can we support mothers and fathers in their families to provide the pattern repetitive experiences that this need, brain needs to grow effectively? And how do we connect that family to a larger community? so that we begin to see that in some ways the return our investments for making decisions that are biologically respectful pay for themselves. 
when we keep creating prisons or we keep creating substance abuse programs, but we don't address what's creating that, we will never, ever have enough money. But when we as elders, just as they came up on and engaged in deep conversation about and listening to what somebody may have a different of opinion, but we listen to those and we then make decisions and then our policies we create are biologically respectful. The practices we engage in, it's like, really, is this a new idea to have integrative services? Do you think when there was this community of people that lived together, they had to talk about creating integrated services? They just were integrated. It's an invention that we have specialized so much that we're fragmented. We've invented it. So if we invented it, we can change it. If we invented this concept that certain people who in some ways can't manage what we're all struggling with. You know, we can look at the person with mental illness, but I look around the room, if you were really honest, you all struggle managing the stress of your life. So we focus on where it's breaking down, but it's breaking us all down. So in today, I, I want to kind of, kind of use the words that my mentor talked about. When we align our interventions with our biology, we can get significant change. When we are disrespectful, all we're doing is creating symptoms. So the more we address substance abuse, the more there'll be substance abuse. The more we address bullying, the more we've got to embrace and bring those people into our community and hold them and know them. And realize, hey, you know what? When I go home, I'm going to abuse a substance. They're not different than me. I could be homeless tomorrow. They're not different than me. So what I ask is, at the end of this conference, you don't just leave and say, what a great conference, symposium. We heard so many, is you take time to reflect. Reflect on your own practices, your own experiences, and ask yourself, this is not not the Colorado Illness Symposium, it's the Health Symposium. How do we continue to focus away from just treating problems, but really creating health. How do we use our knowledge to begin to create healthy communities that we can come here and have those types of discussions, which is unbelievable because most of the time we're in talking about getting money to run programs to in some ways address a problem. If negative experiences can change our biology. What are the positive experiences we need to present to our children and to our community members with enough repetition to create health? Learning about trauma is really about understanding how stress changes our biology. So if we know stress changes our biology, why do we create more and more stress for ourselves? Why don't we start creating opportunities to connect relationally? You heard about nature, you heard about walking. There's incredible ideas out there. Let's really sit down and figure those things out. And finally, how do we align policies and practices with health and not with illness? Those are the things that I hope we leave this symposium with, understanding that really, it's about being biologically respectful. Is that, in a way, not feeding other people is not good for me. There's lots of research that when we give to charity, 
when we help somebody else, random acts of kindness, my immune system gets better. So when we connect and come to the table, we're actually not doing that because we're helping somebody. We're helping ourselves. And when we help ourselves, we help all of them. So in order to help ourselves in the last three or four minutes I have with you, I want you to take a moment before you leave here to realize that you have been in the presence of other people who do not value their success based on having a big house, having multiple cars, but you're in a group of people who value their success on whether they can help other people. Is that, that is very unique in our narcissistic culture. So before you leave here, one is take a moment to recognize what a special person you are. That you come with a mission about making the world a better place for other people. And feel what it's like to really value what you do instead of what you can't, haven't done or what we need to accomplish. Take a moment to recognize how special you are. And before we leave here today, I challenge you to go and connect with somebody else and say thank you for showing up. That is connectedness. That changes our biology. Thank you for taking time to show up to engage in these important discussions to improve the quality of life for others. That's really what this symposium is about. It's about really rejuvenating ourselves, re-energizing ourselves, and reconnecting with others in our community. Thank you very much.